Chapter Nine of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. Vespers. There was a pretty little Episcopal chapel in the village of Wellington, where at Vespers on Sunday afternoons the students were wont to congregate. Six Wellington girls always served as ushers, and the College Glee Club formed the chapel choir. It's a good thing to go to Vespers, remarked Judy one Sabbath afternoon, pinning on her large velvet hat before the mirror over the mantel, notably the most becoming mirror in the house, not only for the welfare of our souls, but also to attire ourselves in decent clothes. I suspect you of thinking it's good for your soul to wear good clothes, Judy, observed Nance. You suspect rightly, then, answered Judy. If I had to dress in rags, I'm afraid my soul would become a thing of shreds and patches, too, all shiny at the seams and down at the heels. Nance laughed. That's a funny way to talk, considering you are about to attend Vespers at the chapel of the good St. Francis, who took the vows of poverty and lived a roving life on the hills around Assisi. That's all very true, said Judy, and I've seen the picture of him being married to Lady Poverty. But our dispositions are different, St. Francis's and mine. I like the roving over the hills part because I'm a wanderer by nature, but I like to wander in nice clothes. My manners are getting to be regular old gray sweater manners, and if I didn't put on my velvet suit and best hat once a week, there's no telling what kind of a rude creature I would become. Why, Julia Keen, I'm ashamed of you, cried Nance. You've as good as confessed that you go to Vespers to show your fine clothes. I don't go to show em, Goosey. I go to wear em but you have no sense of humor. What's the good of telling you anything? Molly there understands my feelings, I am sure. Molly was not listening. She was making calculations at her desk with a blunt pencil on a scrap of paper. I've got as good a sense as you have, cried Nance hotly, only I don't approve of being humorous about sacred things. Nonsense, broke in Judy. Don't you know, child, that you can't limit humor? It spreads over every subject, and it's not necessarily profane because it touches on clothes at church. I suppose you think there is nothing funny about the Reverend Gustavus Adolphus Larson, and you have forgotten how you giggled that Sunday when he announced from the pulpit that his text was taken from St. Paul's Epistle to the Apesians. He's always getting mixed, here put in Molly, who at certain stages in the warm discussions between Nance and Judy always sounded a pacifying note. They do say that he was talking to Miss Walker about one of the faculty pews, and he said, Do you occupy this pie? This was too much for Nance's severity, and she broke down and laughed gaily with the others. He's a funny little man, she admitted, but he's well-meaning. Hurry up, admonished Judy. It's twenty minutes of four, and I want to get a good seat this afternoon. You want to show off your new fashionable headgear, you mean, Miss Vanity said Nance, pinning on her neat brown velvet toque and squinting at herself in the mirror. Oh, me, thought Molly. I wish I had a decent garment to show off. She had intended to buy some clothes that autumn from a purchasing agent who came several times a year to Wellington with catalogs and samples, but she had been afraid to spend any of the money she had earned because of the precarious state of the family finances. She ran her hat pin through her old soft gray felt, which had a bright blue wing at one side and slipped on the coat of her last winter's gray suit. Then she drew white yarn gloves over her kid ones because she had no muff and her hands were always frozen and stoically marched across the campus with her friends. The chapel was already crowded when the girls arrived. They had not heard that the Reverend Gustavus's pulpit was to be filled that afternoon by a preacher from New York. At any rate, they had to sit in the little balcony, which commanded a better view of the minister than it did of the congregation. He was a nice-looking young man with an unaffected manner, and he preached to the packed congregation as if he were talking quietly and simply to one person. At least it seemed so to Molly. The sermon was a short address on faith. It contained no impassioned eloquence nor fiery exhortations, but it impressed the students profoundly. Don't try to instruct God about the management of your lives, he said, any more than you would direct a wise and kind master who employed you to work on his estate. All the great master asks of you is to work well and honestly. The reward is sure to come. You cannot hurry it, and you cannot make it greater than you deserve. 
it is useless to struggle and rage inwardly is not that being rather like a spoiled child who lies on the floor and kicks and screams because his mother won't give him any more cake just put your affairs in the hands of god and go quietly along doing the best you can all of a sudden the conditions you once struggled against will cease to exist and before you have realized it the thing you asked for is yours lots of people the minister said prayed a great deal without believing that their prayers would be heard it reminded him of a little anecdote one sunday morning during a terrible drought a country preacher knelt in the midst of his family at home and prayed earnestly for rain when it was time to start for church the minister noticed that his little daughter was carrying an umbrella why do you take an umbrella my child he asked glancing at the cloudless sky didn't you just pray for rain father she answered all the learning of the ages is not greater than the simple faith of a little child finished the young preacher and now the sermon was over and the girls were chatting in groups outside the chapel or strolling along the sidewalk arm in arm molly had withdrawn from her companions for a moment and was standing alone in a corner of the vestibule i'm afraid i've been acting just like the little child who threw himself on the floor and kicked and screamed for more cake she was thinking i suppose another year at college is just like a nice big hunk of chocolate cake and it wouldn't be good for mental digestion i might as well stop struggling and begin to cram mathematics that's the hardest thing i have and i ought to get in as much of it as i can before i go perhaps you won't have to go at all spoke another voice in her mind but molly couldn't see it that way other letters from her mother had made it clear to her that no more money could be raised there was a good place waiting for her to step into however in a small private school made up of children who lived in the neighborhood she could come home after the mid-year examinations when the present teacher in the school was planning to be married oh miss brown someone said molly looked up quickly it was president walker will you walk along with me i had a letter from your mother last night and i want to speak to you about it the president was a very democratic and motherly woman who not only guided the affairs of the college with a wise hand but kept in personal touch with her girls and it was not unusual to see her walking home from vespers with several students this time however she took molly's arm and led her down the village street without asking any of the others to join her the young girl was very sensible of the honor paid her thus singled out by the president to walk back to college she felt a shy pleasure in the sensation they created as the crowd of students parted to let them pass i am very very sorry to receive this news from your mother miss brown began the president i suppose you know what it is you mean about leaving college miss walker yes it's really a great distress to me to think that one of my queen's girls especially must give up in the middle of her course instead of listening to that young man at vespers i was thinking and thinking about this unwelcome news molly smiled she had managed to listen to the preaching and to think about her affairs at the same time because they somehow seemed to fit together once she almost felt that perhaps he knew all about her case and was preaching to her but of course everybody had problems and lots of the girls thought the same thing no doubt madeleine petite for instance is there no possible way it could be arranged went on the president is this decision of your mother's final evidently mrs brown had not explained why molly was obliged to come home oh she didn't decide it answered the young girl quickly it's because because the money's gone lost i suspected it was something of that sort went on the president now there is a way miss brown by which you could remain if you would be willing to leave queen's cottage i am in charge of a student fund for just such cases as yours this provides for tuition and board not on the campus but in the village you're making something now tutoring the little japanese girl i understand that's good that will help along you will have to manufacture some excuse to your friends about leaving queens otherwise the fund arrangement may remain a secret between you and me miss walker pressed the girl's hand and smiled kindly as she searched her face for some sign of gladness and relief at this offer molly tried to smile back we'll leave everything as it is until the end of this semester continued the president thank you very very much molly said making a great effort to keep her voice from sounding shaky leave queens was it possible the president didn't know that life at queens was the best part of college to her 
would there be any pleasure left if she had to tear herself away from her beloved chums and take up quarters in the village living on a charity fund when she separated from miss walker at the mclean's front door she was so filled with inward lamentations and weeping that she could scarcely say good night to the president who looked somewhat puzzled at the girl's still pale face rushing back to queen's molly flung herself through the front door and tore upstairs on the landing she bumped into judith blount who gave her a sullen angry look please be careful next time and don't take up the whole stairs exclaimed that young woman rudely molly glanced at her wildly what right had she to talk this wretch of a girl who could remain at queen's and live on other people's money oh 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 misery of miseries she rushed up the second flight she was having what judy called the dry weeps at the door of otoya's room she paused it was half open and the little japanese was sitting cross-legged on the floor with the lamp beside her studying may i come in with much gladness answered otoya rising and bowing ceremoniously i want to stay in here a little while otoya away from other people may i sit here by the window in this big chair go on with your lessons i don't want to talk i wanted to be with someone who was quite quiet i should have been obliged to hide in a closet if you hadn't let me in i am very happily glad you came to me said otoyo she helped molly off with her coat and hat pulled out the morris chair so that it faced the window and sat down again quietly with her book at the end of three-quarters of an hour otoyo began to move noiselessly about the room molly was still sitting in the big armchair her hands clasped in her lap presently she became aware that otoya was standing silently before her bearing a lacquer tray on which was a cup of tea and a rice cake otoyo you sweet little dear she said placing the tray on the arm of the chair she gulped down the tea and ate the cake and while the small hostess made another cupful molly continued otoyo i'm going to let god manage my affairs hereafter i'm not going to lie on the floor any more and kick and scream like a spoiled child for another piece of chocolate cake i shall always carry an umbrella now when i pray for rain and i mean to begin tonight to polish up in math i am happily glad said otoyo giving her a gentle sympathetic smile end of chapter nine chapter ten of molly brown's sophomore days by nell speed this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson All's Well That Ends Well There was no happier girl in Wellington one morning than Nance Oldham, and all because she had been invited to the Thanksgiving dance at Exmoor College. Nance had never been to a real dance in her life except a shirtwaist party at the seashore, where she had been a hopeless wallflower because she had known only one man in the room, her father now there was no chance of being a wallflower at exmoor where a girl's card was made out beforehand and she had that warm glow of predestined success from the very beginning of the festivity molly and judy were also invited and the girls were to go over to exmoor on the six forty five trolley with dr and mrs mclean and return on the ten forty five trolley permission having been granted them to stay up until midnight three other wellington girls were bound for the dance on the same car a young teacher chaperoned this little company of which judith blount was one i wonder that judith blount can make up her mind to go to a dance judy keene remarked to molly she's been in such a sullen rage for so long she's turned quite yellow i don't think she will enjoy it it will do her good answered molly dancing always makes people forget their troubles just trying to be graceful puts one in a good humor the scientific reason is child that it stirs up one's circulation and brooding is bad for the circulation added molly it had been a very gloomy holiday the skies black and lowering and a dead warm wind from the south but there had been no sign of rain and now as they alighted from the car at exmoor station they noticed that the wind had shifted slightly to the east and freshened the great blanket of frowning black had broken and a myriad of small clouds were flying across the face of the moon like a flock of frightened sheep molly shivered she had often called herself a human barometer and her spirits were apt to shift with the wind the wind has changed she observed to the doctor i feel it in my bones correct said the doctor scanning the heavens critically 
there's no flavoring extract so strong as a drop of east wind let us hope it will hold back a bit until after the shindig with all its penetrating qualities however the drop of east wind did not affect the air in the beautiful old dining hall of exmoor used always for the larger entertainments its polished hardwood floor and panelled walls its two great open fireplaces in which immense back logs glowed cheerfully made a picture that drove away all memory of bad weather then the music struck up the dancers whirled and circled nance was in a seventh heaven her cheeks glowed her eyes shone and she seemed to float over the floor guided by the steady hand of young andy while his father looked on and smiled laconically every laddie mun ha his lassie he observed to his wife and it's good luck for him when he draws a plain one with a bonny brown eye she's not plain objected mrs mclean she has no furbelows and face nor dress that i can see answered the doctor they're just a boy and a girl andrew don't be anticipating there is no telling how often they may change off before the settling time comes and was it your angel that trained so often asked the doctor with a twinkle in his eye nay nay laddie she protested leaning on the doctor's arm affectionately but those were steadier days i'm thinking there's not so muckle change said the doctor when it comes to sweethearting many old-fashioned dances were introduced that night the cottage lancers and sir roger de coverley led off by the doctor and his wife whose old-world curtsies were very amusing to the young dancers and while the fun waxed fast and furious indoors outside queer things were happening the south wind gently and insistently battling with the east wind had conquered him for the moment all the little clouds that had been scuttling across the heavens before the east wind's icy breath now melted together into a tumbled fleecy mass snowflakes were falling softly and silently clothing the campus and the fields the valleys and hills beyond in a blanket of white then the angry east wind returned from his lair with a new weapon a drenching sheet of cold penetrating rain which changed to drops of ice as it fell and tapped on the high windows of the dining hall a warning rat-a-tat-tat quite drowned in the strains of music the south wind conquered and crushed crept away and the east wind summoning his brother from the north to share the fun played a trick on the world which people in that part of the country will not soon forget together they covered the soft white blanket with a sheet of ice as hard and slippery as plate glass at last having enjoyed themselves immensely they retired out came the moon again shining in the frozen stillness like a great round lantern in the meantime the dance went on and joy was unconfined nobody had the faintest inkling of the drama which had been acted between the east and the south winds most unconscious of all was molly who having danced herself into a state of exuberant spirits sat down to rest with lawrence upton in an ingle nook of one of the big fireplaces as chance would have it they were joined by judith blount and a very dull young man who lawrence informed molly had more money than brains judith had not noticed molly at first probably she would never have chosen that particular spot if she had but the destinies of these two girls had been ordained to touch at intervals in their lives and whenever the meeting occurred something unfortunate always happened they were exactly like two fluids which would not mix comfortably together there was a general movement of partners for supper at this juncture and the two girls found themselves alone for the moment while their escorts departed for coffee and sandwiches are you having a good time molly asked glancing at judith timidly she would have preferred to have said nothing whatever but she had made a compact with herself to try and overcome her dislike for this girl whom she had distrusted from the moment of their first meeting at the railroad station when mr murphy had given molly's baggage check preference did i appear to be a wallflower demanded judith insolently oh i beg your pardon said molly i didn't mean that of course then she sighed and turned toward the fire with a trembly unnerved feeling i don't believe i'll ever get used to having people cross to me she thought it always frightens me i suppose i'm too sensitive she began to shiver slightly the wind is surely in the east now she added to herself when the young men came back bearing each a tray with supper for two she was grateful for the cup of steaming coffee 
Will you hold this for a minute, Miss Molly? asked Lawrence Upton, while I get a chair to rest it on. Lap tables are about as unsteady as tables on shipboard. Judith's partner had followed Lawrence's example, and presently the two students were seen hurrying through the throng, each pushing a chair in front of him. By some strange fatality, history was to repeat itself. Just as he reached the girls, the young person who had more money than brains slipped on a fragment of buttered bread which had fallen off somebody's plate, skidded along, bumped his chair into Lawrence, who lost his balance and fell against poor Molly's tray. Then, oh, dreadful calamity, over went the cup of coffee straight onto Judith's yellow satin frock. Molly could have sunk into the floor with the misery of that moment, and yet she had not in the least been the cause of the accident. It was a small-brained, rich individual who was to blame. But Judith was not in any condition to reckon with original causes. Molly had been carrying the tray with the coffee cups, and that was enough for her. She leapt to her feet, shaking her drenched dress and scattering drops of coffee in every direction. You awkward, clumsy creature, she cried, stamping her foot as she faced Molly. Why do you ever touch a coffee cup? Are you always going to upset coffee on me and my family? You have ruined my dress. You did it on purpose. I saw you were very angry a moment ago, and you did it for revenge. Molly shrank back in her seat, her face turning from crimson to white and back to crimson again. Don't answer her, said a small voice in her mind. Be silent, be silent. But Miss Blount, began her supper partner, feeling vaguely that justice must be done. I stumbled, don't you know? Awfully awkward of me, of course, but I slipped on an infernal piece of banana peel or something and fell against Upton. Hope your gown isn't ruined. It is ruined, cried Judith, her face transformed with rage. It's utterly ruined, and she did it. It isn't the first time she's flung coffee cups around. Last winter she ruined my cousin's new suit of clothes. She's the most careless, awkward, clumsy creature I ever saw. I... A curious little group had gathered over near the fireplace, but Judith was too angry to care who heard what she was saying. In the meantime, Lawrence Upton had taken his stand between Judith and Molly, feeling somehow that he might protect poor Molly from the onslaught. Presently, he took her hand and drew it through his arm. Suppose we join the McLeans, he said. I see they are having supper all together over there. As they turned to leave, he said to Judith in a cold, even voice that seemed to bring her back to her senses. I upset the coffee. Blanchard fell against me and joggled my arm. If there is any reparation I can make, I shall be glad to do it. Whereupon, Judith departed to the dressing room and was not seen again until it was time to leave. What a tiger cat she is, whispered Lawrence to Molly as he led her across the room. Molly did not answer. She was afraid to trust her voice just then, and still more afraid of what she might say if she dared speak. "'What was all that rumpus over there?' demanded Judy, when the young people had joined their friends. "'Oh, just a little volcanic activity on the part of Mount Etna, and a good deal of slinging of hot lava. Miss Molly and I are refugees from the eruption, and Mount Etna has gone upstairs.' "'You mean Miss Etna Blount?' asked Judy. "'The same,' said Lawrence." When it was time for the Wellington party to catch the trolley car home, they emerged from the warm, cheerful dining hall into a world of dazzling whiteness. The trees were clothed in it, and the ground was covered with a crust of ice as hard and shining as marble. A path of ashes was sprinkled before them, so that they walked safely as far as the station. "'Heaven help us at the other end!' Mrs. McLean exclaimed, clinging to the doctor's arm. The car was late in arriving at Exmoor Station. At last it hove into sight, moving at a hesitating gait along the slippery rails, but it had a comfortably warm interior, and they were glad to climb in out of the bitter cold. All aboard, called the conductor. Last car tonight. There is always a gloomy fatality in the announcement, last car tonight. It is just as if a doctor might say, nothing more can be done. Clang, clang, went the bell, and they moved slowly forward. After an age of slipping and sliding, frequent stopping and starting, and exchanges of loud confidences between the motorman and the conductor, the car came to a dead stop. Dr. McLean, who had been sound asleep and snoring loudly, waked up. Bless my soul, are we there? he demanded. 
no sir and far from it answered the conductor who had opened the door and come inside beating his hands together for warmth far from it what do you mean by that my good man asked the doctor there ain't no more power sir answered the man the trolley's just a solid cable of ice and budge she won't you couldn't move her with a derrick but what are we to do asked the doctor i couldn't say sir unless you walked it's only a matter of about two miles otherwise you'd have to spend the night here and it'll be a cold place there ain't no more heat is there jim there ain't was jim's brief reply i guess jim and i'll foot it into wellington and the best you can do is to come along the doctor and his wife conferred with the young teacher who had chaperoned the other party the question was would it not be a greater risk to walk two miles in thin-soled shoes and party dresses over that wilderness of ice than to remain snugly in the car until they could get help the motorman and conductor were well protected from the cold and from slipping too with heavy overcoats and arctic shoes while they were talking these two individuals took their departure letting in a cold blast of air as they slid the door back to get out the wellington crowd sat huddled together hoping to keep warm by human contact they tried to beguile the weary hours with conversation but time dragged heavily and the car grew colder and colder some of the girls began to move up and down practicing physical culture exercises and beating their hands together i think it would be better to walk announced mrs mclean at last we are in much greater danger of freezing to death sitting here than moving we'll stick to the track it won't be so slippery between the rails even the doctor was relieved at this suggestion fearful as he was of slipping on the ice the good wife was right as she always was and the lassies had better take the risk and come along quickly before they realized it they were on the track with faces turned hopefully toward wellington scarcely had they taken six steps before three of the girls tumbled flat and while they were picking themselves up dr and mrs mclean sat down plump on the ice hand in hand like two astonished children it was quite impossible to keep from laughing at this ludicrous situation especially when the doctor's great ha ha made the air tremble the ones who were standing helped the ones who had fallen to rise and fell themselves in the effort if we only had on skates cried judy wouldn't it be glorious we could skate anywhere right across the fields or along the road it's just like a sea of solid ice for an hour they took their precarious way along the track which was now on the edge of a high embankment a grand place for coasting remarked judy peeping over the edge suddenly her heels went over her head and her horrified friends beheld her sliding backwards down the hill are you hurt at all my lass called the doctor peeping fearfully over the side and holding on to his wife as a drowning man catches at a life preserver hurt no cried judy convulsed with laughter do you think you can crawl back asked mrs mclean doubtfully then judy began the most difficult ascent of her life on hands and knees there was nothing to take hold of and when she had got halfway up back she slipped to the bottom again a second time she had almost reached the top when she lost her footing and once more slipped to the base of the embankment you'd better go on without me she cried half sobbing and half laughing the doctor was very uncomfortable not for worlds would he have put foot outside the trolley rails but something had to be done let's make a human ladder suggested molly as they do in melodramas i'll go first nance you take my foot and somebody hold on to yours and so on then judy can climb up catching hold of us the doctor considered this a good scheme and the human chain was accordingly formed the doctor himself grasping the ankle of the last volunteer who happened to be judith blount but hardly had judy commenced the upward climb when the doctor's heels went over his head and the entire human ladder found itself huddled together at the foot of the embankment it's a case of every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost exclaimed the doctor sitting up stiffly and rubbing his shins help yourselves lassies i can do nae mair some of them reached the track at last and some of them didn't and those who couldn't make it were molly and judith blount you'll have to follow along as best as you can down there called mrs mclean grasping her husband's arm we'll keep an eye on you from above once more the belated revelers started on their way while molly and judith blount pursued a difficult path between a frozen creek and the trolley embankment end of chapter ten
Chapter Eleven of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Great Sleet of Nineteen Ought. Many a fall and many a bruise they got that night as they crept along the frozen path. At last they reached a point where the creek had been turned abruptly from its bed and passed through a culvert under the embankment. Here the path also changed its course and headed for the golf links of the college. They can never get down the embankment, and we can never get up, remarked Judith, who appeared to have forgotten that she had lately been a human volcano. Why can't we take the shortcut back? It couldn't be any worse than this. Why not, answered Molly politely, although it must be confessed she was still tingling under the lash of Judith's flaying tongue, and not one word had she spoken since they left the others. Mrs. McLean, called Judith, making a trumpet of her hands. We're going to cut across the golf links. It will be easier. But I'm afraid for you to go alone at this time of night, answered Mrs. McLean. What could harm them a night like this? expostulated her husband. Very well, then. I suppose it's all right, said the distracted and wearied lady. Don't be uneasy, Mrs. McLean. You'll take the high road, and we'll take the low, but we'll gang to Wellington afore ye, called Molly, laughing. After all, wasn't it absurd enough to make a body laugh? One man, eight helpless women slipping and sliding after him, and she herself making off in the darkness with the only enemy she had ever known. She wished it had been Judy or Nance. She was sure they would have giggled all the way. But whoever wanted to laugh in the presence of this black-browed, fierce-tempered Judith? They walked silently on for some time until they came to a little hill. I guess we'll have to crawl it, sighed Molly. Long before this, they had pinned their long skirts up around their waists, and now on hands and knees they began the difficult ascent. Just as they reached the top, Molly's slipper bag somehow got away from her and went sliding to the bottom. Suddenly, both girls began to laugh. They laughed until the echoes rang, and Molly, losing her grasp on a bush, went sliding after the bag. Oh, laughed Judith. Oh, Molly, I shall... And then the twigs she had been clutching pulled out of the ice, and down she went on top of Molly. The two girls sat up and looked at each other. They felt warmer and happier from the laugh. Judith, exclaimed Molly suddenly, I could never laugh with anyone like that and not be friends. It's almost like accepting hospitality. Shall we be friends again? Oh, yes, replied Judith eagerly. I am sorry I was rude tonight about the coffee, Molly. You know, it's my terrible temper. Once it gets a start, I can't seem to hold it in, and I've had a great deal to try me lately. I apologize to you now. Will you accept my apology? Yes, indeed, Molly assured her. Come along, let's try again. Once we get to the top of this little disincline, as an old colored man at home would call it, we'll be on the links. The girls both reached the summit at the same moment, and as they scanned the wide expanse before them, they exclaimed in frightened whispers, There comes a man. Instantly, they slid back to the bottom again and lay in a heap, gasping and giggling. Where shall we go? What shall we do? exclaimed Judith. Nothing, answered Molly. We can hardly crawl, much less run, but I suppose he can't either, so perhaps we are as safe here as anywhere. But what man except a burglar could be prowling around Wellington at this hour, whispered Judith. I can't think of anyone, but I should think no sensible burglar would come out a night like this. Besides, do burglars ever come to Wellington? Once there was one, only he wasn't a real burglar. He was a lunatic who had escaped from an asylum near Exmoor. Oh, heavens, Judith, a lunatic? I'd rather meet ten burglars. After all, only a lunatic would come out on such a night. Can't we run? Molly had a fear of crazy people that she had never been able to conquer. They rose unsteadily on their frozen feet and began hurrying back in the direction of the trolley embankment. As they ran, they heard a long sliding, scraping sound. Evidently, the man had slid down the little hill. They could hear the sound of his footsteps on the ice. He was running after them. At last he called, Wait, wait, whoever you are, I'm not going to hurt you. In another moment he had caught up with them. Oh, joy of joys, it was Professor Green, wearing a thick gray sweater and a cap with earmuffs. 
with a cry of relief judith flung herself on her cousin's neck while molly rather timidly clasped his arm she felt she could have hugged him too if he had only been a relation we thought you were an escaped lunatic she exclaimed i am he answered at least i've been nearly crazy trying to get news of you he took her hand and drew it firmly through his arm while judith appropriated his other arm they telephoned over from exmoor to know if you had reached wellington safely we found at the village that the car had not arrived then about twenty minutes ago they called us from the car station to say that the conductor and motorman had walked but that you had decided to remain in the car all night i thought i had better go over and persuade you not to freeze to death by degrees i am glad you decided to walk where are the others they have got on by the track answered molly we slipped down the embankment and couldn't crawl up again perhaps you could catch them if you branched off here and took the other road never mind answered the professor tucking her arm more tightly through his dr mclean can look after the others now that his burdens are lightened by two i'd better see you across this skating rink mrs murphy is up waiting for you i stopped and told her to get hot soup and water bottles and things ready you're a dear cousin edwin exclaimed judith you are always thinking of other people i expect the old doctor will be a good deal knocked up by this little jaunt went on the professor not taking the slightest notice of judith's expressions of gratitude the first molly had ever heard her make about anything it was half past two o'clock when they reached queen's cottage just ten minutes before the others arrived it's a good thing you found us molly said to the professor as he helped them up the steps i believe we'd have been crawling over those links another hour or so if you hadn't i can never explain what made me cut across the links he answered i had my face turned toward the other road when something urged me to go that way dr mclean always insisted that it was continuous giggling that kept them all from freezing that bitter night judith blount was the only one in the party who suffered from the experience she spent a week in the infirmary with a deep cold and sore throat you see explained judy keen sagely to her two friends her system was weakened by that awful fit of temper she lost all mental and bodily poise and took the first disease that came her way she certainly lost all bodily poise laughed molly i didn't have any more than she did we slipped around like two helpless infants but you didn't take cold said judy i've made up my mind not to have any colds this winter announced molly seriously after all there's a good deal in just declining to entertain them i think the grip is a sort of bully who attacks people who are afraid of him and keeps away from the ones who are not cowards the three girls spent half a day in bed sleeping off their weariness and on friday afternoon they were able to call on mrs mclean who being a hearty scotchwoman was none the worse from the walk the doctor she said had been up since seven o'clock attending to his patients the truth is she added he would not have missed the sight for anything the whole world turned into a skating rink and the campus the center of it everybody in wellington who could wear skates was out that afternoon the campus and golf links as well as the lake were covered with circling gliding figures the best skaters coasted downhill on their skates as men do on snowshoes they went with incredible speed and the impetus carried them up the next hill without any effort molly had seen very little skating at home she had learned as a child but as she grew up the sport had not appealed to her because somebody was always falling in and the ice never lasted longer than a day or so now however the picture of the circling swaying crowd of skaters thrilled her with a new desire to see if she had forgotten how to balance herself on steel runners isn't it beautiful she cried i never saw anything so graceful they are like birds first they soar then they flap their wings and soar again flap their feet you mean interrupted judy and woe to her who flops instead of flaps mary stuart came sailing up to them gave a beautiful curving turn and then stopped isn't this glorious sport she cried her cheeks glowing with exercise has your president told you about the skating carnival it's just been decided and i suppose you haven't seen her yet it's to take place tomorrow night won't it be beautiful what fun cried molly what a wonderful sight now molly you are to wrap up very warm continued mary no matter what kind of a costume you decide to wear no cheesecloth liberty masquerades will go remember 
Oh, but I can't be in the carnival. I haven't any skates, said Molly. I have another pair, answered Mary quickly. I'll bring them over to you later. Molly never guessed that this loving friend skated straight down to the village that very instant and bought a pair of skates screwed onto stout shoes at the general store. Tossing away the wrapping paper and smearing the shoes with snow and ashes to take off the new look, she delivered them at Queen's before supper. It's lucky I knew what number Molly wore, she said to herself, as she sailed up the campus on her Canadian skates, with strokes as sweepingly broad and generous as her own fine nature. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Skating Carnival. All fears of a thaw on the heels of this unprecedented cold wave were put to flight next morning. The thermometer hovered at four degrees above zero, and the air was dry and sparkling. Only those who remained indoors and lingered over the registers felt the cold. There was a great deal to be done before evening. Costumes had to be devised, bonfires built along the lake and at intervals on the links, lanterns hung everywhere possible, and lastly, a quick rehearsal. The best skaters were chosen to give exhibitions of fancy skating. There were to be several races and a grand march. Molly learned the night before that a sense of balance having once been acquired is never lost. After supper, she had ventured out on the campus with Judy and Nance, who were both excellent skaters. With a grace that was peculiarly her own in spite of the first unsteadiness, Molly had been able to skate to the quadrangle. There, removing her skating shoes and putting on slippers, she had skipped upstairs to thank Mary Stewart for her kindness. The return to Queens over the campus had been even easier, and next morning she felt that she could enter the carnival. Nobody had a chance to talk about costumes until after lunch on Saturday, when there was a meeting of the three friends to decide. I don't see how I can go. I haven't a thing picturesque, exclaimed Nance dejectedly. Now, Nance, you have no imagination, said Judy. One day you tell me I have no sense of humor, and another that I have no imagination. You'll be telling me I have no brains next. Here, eat this and stop quarreling, interrupted Molly, thrusting a plate of fudge before them. When in doubt, eat fudge and wisdom will come. Judy ate her fudge in silence. Then suddenly she cried exultantly, Eureka! Wisdom hath come, yea, even to the humble in spirit. Heaven hath enlightened me. I know what we'll wear, girls. What? they demanded, having racked their brains in vain to think of something both warm and picturesque. We'll go, continued Judy impressively, as three Russian princesses. What in? Leave that to me. You just do as I tell you. Nance, skate down to the village and buy a big roll of cotton batting. Make them wrap it up well so as not to offer suggestions to others. What must I do? asked Molly. You must turn up the hems of skirts. Take your old last winter's brown one and Nance's old green one and, and my velvet one. Your best skirt, exclaimed Nance, aghast. Yes, why not? We only live once, replied the reckless Judy. Turn up the hems all around and baste them. They should reach just to the shoe tops. That afternoon, they hurriedly sewed bands of cotton batting around the bottoms of their skirts, bordered their jackets with it, made cuffs and muffs and high turbans. Then Judy dotted the cotton with shoe blacking, and it became a realistic imitation of royal ermine. Each girl wore a band of brilliant ribbon across the front of her coat with a gilt pasteboard star pinned to it. I suppose this might be taken for the order of the star and garter, observed Judy. At any rate, we are royal princesses of the illustrious house of Russia, the princesses Molitska, Nanitska, and Judikinovich. Those are Russian enough, aren't they? Never will Molly forget the fun of that glorious evening, nor the beautiful picture of the meadows and fields dazzling white in the moonlight. While the workers of the four classes lit the fires and lanterns, the drones circled about on the ice singing college songs. From over at Exmoor came a crowd of youths who had skated the ten miles uphill and down dale to see the carnival. Sleighing parties from nearby estates drove over with rough-shod teams to draw the sleighs, and all Wellington turned out to see the sights. 
I didn't believe there could be so much originality in the world, thought Molly, admiring the costumes of the students. There were many teddy bears and bunny rabbits. One girl wore a black velvet suit with a leopard skin over her shoulder. On her head was a mythological-looking crown with a pair of cow's horns standing upright at each side. There were numerous Russian gypsies and two Dr. Cooks wearing long black mustaches, each carrying a little pole with an American flag nailed at the top. Jessie Lynch, not being a skater, sat in a chair on runners while her good-natured chum Margaret Wakefield pushed her about the lake. Margaret wore a Chinese costume and her long queue was made of black skirt braid. After the parade and the exhibitions of skating, there was general skating and the lake became a scene of changing color and variety. It's like a gorgeous Christmas card, thought Molly, practicing strokes by herself in one corner while she watched the circle of skaters skim by her. And how very light it is. I can plainly recognize Nance going over the hill with Andy McLean. Here she is, called Lawrence Upton, breaking from the circle and skating towards her as easily, apparently, as a bird flies. His body leaned slightly. His hands were clasped behind his back, and Mercury with his winged shoes could not have moved more gracefully. Come on, Miss Molly, and have a turn, he said. What? Me, the poorest skater on the pond? Nonsense. You couldn't dance so well if you were a poor skater. Just cross hands like this and sail along. I won't let you fall. Off they did sail, and never was a more delightful sensation than Molly's, flying over the smooth ice with this good-looking young Mercury. Around and round they skimmed until one of the Exmoor boys blew a horn, the signal that it was time to start the ten miles back to college. Very rough skating it was in places, so Lawrence informed Molly, rather dangerous going down some of the steep hills, but glorious fun. Why don't you do like Baron Munchausen on the mountain? Sit on a silk handkerchief and slide down, suggested Molly. We have done some sliding of that kind, he answered laughing but it was accidental and there was no time to get out a pocket handkerchief. At last the great carnival was over and Molly, falling in with the crowd of campus girls, started for home, singing with the others. Good night, ladies, we're going to leave you now. It was nearly ten when she tramped upstairs, still on her skates. Judy called out to her from her room, but Nance had not returned. Molly unlaced the skating boots, removed the Russian princess costume, and, flinging her time-worn eider-down cape around her shoulders, sat down to toast her toes. Judy, she called presently, what have you done with Nance? The last I saw of the lady Nance, she was going over the hill with her sandy-haired cavalier. I saw her too, but I haven't met up with her since. I'm afraid she will get a calling if she isn't back pretty soon. The girls waited silently. Presently they heard the last of the carnival revelers return. The clock in the tower struck ten. Mrs. Markham locked the hall door and put out the hall light, and still no Nance. She's gone off skating with Sandy Andy and forgot the time, whispered Judy, who had crept into Molly's room to confer. It's a good joke on proper old Nance. I think she was never known to break a rule before. You don't suppose anything could have happened to them, do you? Of course not. But you know how absorbed they do get in conversation. They wouldn't hear a cannon go off a yard away. They are awfully strict here about being out with boys, observed Molly uneasily. I do wish she would come home. The girls lingered over the register, talking in whispers until the clock struck half past ten. Molly, suppose they have eloped, Judy observed. Eloped, repeated Molly, amazed. Then she began to laugh. Judy, is there anybody in the world so romantic as you? Why, they are mere infants. Andy isn't nineteen yet, and Nance was only eighteen last month. I think we'd better slip out and find them. Come on. Very quietly, the two girls got into their things. They wore their rubbers this time, and Molly very thankfully carried the imitation ermine muff. The entire household was sound asleep when out into the sparkling, glittering world they crept like two conspirators. Suppose we try the links first, suggested Judy, since both of us saw them disappearing last in that direction. If we were really ladylike persons, we'd be afraid to go scurrying off here in the dark, observed Molly. I'm not afraid of anything, Judy replied, and Molly knew she spoke the truth, for Judy was the most fearless girl she had ever known. When they reached the summit of the hill, they began calling at the tops of their voices. Nance! Nance Oldham! 
there was no answer and not in all the broad expanse of whiteness could they see a human being i wish i knew what to do exclaimed molly growing more and more uneasy suppose she has been injured suppose suppose there they are cried judy the young rascals i believe they are utterly oblivious to time far over the ice appeared the two figures they were not skating but walking and several times before they reached the girls they slipped and fell down you are a nice pair cried judy don't you know it's way after hours and everybody is in bed long ago why nance dear what has happened why are you walking asked molly who was rarely known to scold anybody i am very sorry said nance stiffly i couldn't help it the heel of my shoe came off and i couldn't skate mr mclean judy smiled mischievously they've been quarreling she said under her breath and mr mclean had to bring me back much against his will nothing of the sort miss oldham put in mr mclean flushing angrily i was very glad to bring you back i only said never mind what you said it was your manner actions speak louder than words come along put in molly this is no time for quarrels it's after eleven andy what will you do skate back to exmoor or stay at your father's i shall skate back of course he answered in a heroic voice the other fellows might think something had happened to me here nance put on one of my overshoes said judy that will keep you from slipping and we must hasten ere the midnight chime doth strike farewell andrew god bless you and a safe journey my boy judy struck a dramatic attitude and molly was obliged to laugh in spite of the serious faces of the others hadn't i better see you home asked andrew stiffly forsooth no good gentleman be gone and the sooner the better come on you silly goose laughed molly and the three girls hurried home once they stopped to look back and young andy skating as if the foul fiends were after him was almost at the end of the course there was no miss steele that winter to keep a sharp ear open for latecomers and the girls crept safely up to bed twice in the night molly heard nance weeping bitterly but she said nothing because she knew that such quarrels are soon mended end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. The Thaw. Next day began the thaw, and in a week the whole earth appeared to have melted into an unpleasant, muddy colored liquid. An icy dampness permeated the air. It chilled the warmth of the soul and changed the hue of existence to a sad gray. Judy and Molly were prepared to see Nance thaw with the great sleet and melt into little rivulets of feeling and remorse. She had seemed rather hard on Andy Jr. that night, but Nance remained implacable and had no word to say on the subject. "'She's as ice-bound as ever!' exclaimed Judy, shaking her head ruefully. "'I am afraid she still belongs to the glacial period. Don't you think you can warm her up a little and make her forgive poor Andy?' Perhaps the sun will do it, said Molly, lifting her skirts as she waded through the slush on the campus. The two girls were on their way to a class, and there was no time to linger for discussions about Nance's unforgiving nature. But there was nothing Judy enjoyed more than making what she learnedly termed psychological speculations concerning her friend's sentiments. Do stop tearing along, Molly, while I talk. I have something interesting to say. Judy Keene there must be a depression on your head where there should be a perfectly good bump of duty don't you know we have only five minutes to get to the class i'd rather be late to almost anything than lit too and why pray demanded judy rushing to keep up with molly's long steps oh well because it's interesting is that the only reason why don't you turn into a period occasionally juliana you are every other variety of punctuation mark dashes exclamations interrogations sometimes you're a comma and i've known you to be a semicolon but when oh when have you come to a full stop all this long peroration pero what means that you're avoiding the real question here we are ejaculated molly with a sigh of relief as she ran upstairs and entered the classroom at the same moment that professor green appeared from another door 
Molly freely admitted to her friends that English literature was the most interesting study she had. She took more pains over the preparation for this class than for any of her other lessons. She was always careful not to be late, but then sat timidly and modestly in the back row with the girls who wished to avoid being called upon to recite. The professor's lectures, however, led her into an enchanted country, the land of poetry and romance. Perhaps at first he thought she really wished to avoid being questioned and that her spellbound expression was only indifference. Certainly he had seldom tested her interest until one day during a lecture on the pre-Raphaelite artists and poets he calmly requested her to stand up before the entire class and read Rossetti's Blessed Demoiselle. Blushing hotly, she began the reading in a thin, frightened voice, but presently the amused faces of her friends faded away. Her voice regained its full measure of strength and beauty, and when she had finished, she became aware that somewhere hidden within the wellsprings of her mind was a power she had not known of before. Molly's classmates were much impressed by her performance, but there was a faint smile on the professor's face that seemed to imply that he was not in the least surprised. Among all the little happenings that infest our daily lives, it is often the least and most accidental that wields the strongest influence. This chance discovery by Molly that she could read poetry aloud gave her infinite secret pleasure. She began to memorize and repeat to herself all her favorite poems. Sometimes her pulses beat time to the rhythm in her head. Even her speech at some times became unconsciously metrical, and as she walked she felt her body swing to the music of the verse. With a strange shyness, she hid the secret from her friends, who never guessed when she sat quietly with them that she was chanting poetry to herself. Molly had planned to do several errands that afternoon, after the class in Lit Two. The first one took her to the village to see Madeline Petit, the little southern girl who was willing to do almost any kind of work to earn money. Molly had never returned the magazine clippings of prize offers, and she had also another reason for wanting to see Madeline. She wished to find out just how different life in a room over the post office was from life at Queen's. She was thankful when the lesson was over that Judy was engaged for basketball practice in the gym, for she wished to be alone when she made this call. Only a few days before, Miss Walker had called to her after chapel and suggested that she look over the rooms the postmistress rented to students and make her choice so that lodgings could be spoken for before Christmas. Molly paused at Madeline's door and read the sign carefully. I suppose I shall have to be fixing up something like that, she thought. Only I never could do up jabots, and I'd rather scrub floors than shampoo people's heads. Come in, called the liquid melting voice of the southern girl in answer to Molly's tap. Oh, how do you do? What a delightful welcome surprise, cried the hospitable little person. Put your feet over the register. That's where I spend most of my time now. I'm not used to this awful climate. Now give me your hat and coat. You are to have tea with me, you know. You won't mind if I go on working, will you? I'm doing up some jabots and things for that sweet Miss Stewart. She has given me a lot of work. Such a lady, if she is a Yankee. I can safely say that to you, because you aren't one, you know. But really, I'm beginning to like these northern girls so much. They are quite as nice as the girls from home, only quieter, rattled on Miss Petit. Molly groaned inwardly. If she only didn't talk so much, she thought, I'm always putting up milestones during her ramblings to remind me of something I wanted to say, but there's never any chance to go back, even if I could remember where I put them. I wanted to return these clippings, she managed to edge in at last, producing the slips of papers. Oh, you needn't have bothered. I shall never use any of them. I told you there was nothing but mathematics in my soul. I can't write at all. The themes are the horror of my life. But you tried, I'm sure. Was it the short story or one of the advertising ones? They are all of them terribly unsatisfactory because you never know where you stand until months and months afterwards when you read that somebody has won the prize. But of course, I never expect to win prizes. I could never make a coup d'etat like that. You could make a coup de tongue, thought Molly, sighing helplessly. But did you try? asked Madeline, now actually pausing for a reply to her question. I did try one of them, a little poem that came into my head, but it was weeks ago, and I know nothing will come of it. I felt when I sent it off that it wasn't the kind of thing they wanted, wasn't advertising enough. 
I had really almost forgotten I wrote it. So many other things have happened since. Can you keep a secret, Miss Petite? I certainly can, replied the busy little creature, pausing in her labors to test the iron. Dear me, I must be careful not to scorch any of these pretty things. But the tea kettle is boiling. Suppose we have some refreshment and you can tell me the secret and comfort. Molly smiled at her own southern peculiarities cropping out in this little friend. Mama sent me this caramel cake yesterday. It's made from a very old recipe. I hope you like the tea. I'm sorry I can't offer you any real cream. I would just as soon eat cold cream for the complexion as condensed cream. It's all right for cooking with, but it doesn't go well with tea and coffee, which I always make in my own rooms, especially coffee. It's never strong enough at the place I take my meals. But you said something about a secret? Somehow Molly's affairs seemed to dwindle into insignificance in comparison with this great tidal wave of conversation, and she resolved not to take Madeline into her confidence after all. It occurred to her that she would soon become a raving maniac if she lived next door to anyone who talked as much as that. It's really not much of a secret, answered Molly lightly. Miss Walker asked me to come down and look over some empty rooms here for someone, and I thought maybe if you could spare the time you would come with me. I can always spare the time to be of service to you, exclaimed Madeline. You have done so much for me. You really gave me my start here, you know. Nonsense, put in Molly. Yes, you did. You sent Miss Stewart to me and introduced me to some of the older girls who have all been very nice. They would probably never have heard of me but for you. When they had finished the tea and cake, which were delicious, they inspected the vacant rooms to a steady accompaniment of Madeline's conversation. Molly wondered how the capable, clever, industrious little creature could accomplish so much when her tongue went like a clap hammer most of the time. But there was no doubt that she had achieved marvels and was already well up in her classes. Poor Molly's temples ached with a steady hum. Her tongue was dry, and she had a wild impulse to jump out the window. How could she explain to kind Miss Walker that she could not live over the post office? Would it not be an unfriendly act to tell the real reason? It's bad enough as it is, she thought, leaving my sweet old queens, but this would be beyond human endurance. It will have to be a room over the general store or at Mrs. O'Reilly's. Anything but this. The post office rooms were bare and crude, and poor Molly was sick at heart when at last she took her leave of the little friend, who was still babbling unceasingly when the door closed. Molly breathed a deep sigh of relief as she waded through the slush on the sidewalk. It will be a good deal like being banished from the promised land, she said to herself, wherever it is. Pausing at the door of the general store, she noticed a big, black, funereal-looking vehicle coming up the street at a slow pace. Passers-by paused to look at it with a kind of morbid curiosity as it drew nearer. Oh, heavens, I hope that isn't an undertaker's wagon, Molly thought, preparing to flee from the dread sight which always filled her with the horrors. The big vehicle passed slowly by. On the front seat with the driver sat Dr. McLean. He bowed to her gravely, barely lifting his hat. One of his patients, her thoughts continued, but it's strange for him to ride on the same wagon. I don't think I can possibly look at those other rooms today. She turned her face away from the general store and hastened back to the university, which seemed to be the only thing that retained its dignity and beauty under the disenchanting influences of this muggy, damp day. As she walked up the avenue, there some distance ahead was the gruesome equipage. Heavens, heavens, I haven't heard about anything, she exclaimed. The wagon did not pause at the infirmary as she expected, but pursued its way until it reached the McLean house. Molly began to run, and just as she arrived breathless and excited, the vehicle had backed up to the steps, two doors swung open, and Mrs. McLean, accompanied by a trained nurse, stepped out. The doctor climbed down from one side of the vehicle and the driver from the other. Professor Green sprung up from somewhere, he had probably been waiting in the McLean's hall, and the three men gently lifted out a stretcher on which lay the almost unrecognizable form of Andy Jr. A large bandage encircled his head, and one arm was done up in splints. Oh, Mrs. McLean, whispered Molly, I didn't know. But Mrs. McLean only shook her head and hurried after the stretcher. Molly sat down on the muddy steps and waited. 
After what seemed an age, Professor Green emerged from the house. You are a reckless girl to sit there in all that dampness, he exclaimed. Never mind me. What about Andy? He's in pretty bad shape, I am afraid, answered the professor. He was hurt the night of the carnival in some way. I don't know just how it happened that he lost the others. At any rate, they found him after a long hunt, half frozen to death, a gash in his head and several broken bones. They thought they had better bring him home, where the doctor could look after him, but he hasn't stood the journey as well as they hoped. Poor Nance, said Molly, as she hastened back to Queen's. End of chapter 13「fourteen of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. Oh, Molly, what was that awful black wagon that went up the avenue a few minutes ago? demanded half a dozen voices as she opened the door into her own room. The freshman at the infirmary who was threatened with typhoid fever is getting well, remarked Margaret Wakefield. "'Surely nothing has happened to any of the Wellington girls,' put in Jessie uneasily. "'No, no,' answered Molly. "'Nothing so terrible as that, thank goodness. "'It wasn't an undertaker's wagon, but an ambulance.' "'She paused. "'It would be rather hard on Nance to tell the news about Andy before all the girls. "'It looks something like the Exmoor ambulance,' here observed Catherine Williams. "'Molly was silent.' suppose she should tell the sad news and nance should break down and make a scene it would be cruel i'll wait until they go she decided but this was not easy who was in the ambulance molly asked judy impatiently i should think you would have had curiosity enough to have noticed where it stopped it was no use wrinkling her eyebrows at judy or trying to evade her direct questions the inquisitive girl went on wasn't that dr mclean on the seat with the driver naturally he would be there being the only physician in wellington replied molly then lawyer wakefield began a series of cross questions that fairly made the poor girl quail in which direction were you going when you met the ambulance asked this persistent judge i was coming this way of course and you mean to say your curiosity didn't prompt you to turn around and see where the ambulance stopped i didn't say that faltered molly feeling very much like a prisoner at the bar you did turn and look then was it toward the faculty houses or the quadrangle that the ambulance was driving well really judge wakefield i think i had better seek legal advice before replying to your questions margaret laughed i only wanted to prove to myself that the only way to get at the truth of a matter is by a system of questions which require direct answers it's like the game of twenty questions which is the most interesting game in the world when it's properly played once i guessed the ring on the pope's finger in six questions just by careful deduction it's easier to get at the truth by subtracting than adding truth indeed you haven't got a bit nearer than any of us burst in the incorrigible judy with all your legal mind you haven't made molly tell us who was in the ambulance and of course she knows she has never said she didn't yet molly felt desperately uncomfortable she wished now that she had told them in the beginning it had only made matters worse not to tell molly you are the strangest person what possible reason could you have for keeping secret who was in the ambulance was it one of the students or one of the faculty demanded nance people who live in the country say that cabs are the most inquisitive creatures in the world but i think girls are remarked molly this is as good as a play cried one of the williams girls a real play behind footlights to sit here and look on at this little comedy of curiosity you've asked every conceivable question under the sun and molly there has never told a thing now i happen to know that the ambulance is connected with the sanatorium over near exmoor i saw it once when we were walking and it is therefore probably bringing someone from exmoor here then if you wish to inquire further by the deductive method as judge wakefield calls it who at exmoor has connections at wellington dodo green and annie mclean said judy quickly exactly answered edith nance's eyes met molly's and in a flash she understood why her friend had been parrying the questions of the other girls it was to save her from a shock perhaps some of the other girls recognized this too for margaret and the williamses rose at the same moment and made excuses to go and the others soon followed 
Only blundering and thoughtless Judy remained to blunder more. Molly Brown, she exclaimed, you have been getting so full of mysteries and secrets lately that you might as well live in a tower all alone. Now why? Is he very badly hurt, Molly? interrupted Nance in a cold, even voice, not taking the slightest notice of Judy's complaints. Pretty badly, Nance. The journey over from Exmoor was harder on him than they thought it would be. I stood beside the stretcher for a minute. Nance walked over to the side window and looked across the campus in the direction of the McLean house. On the small section of the avenue which could be seen from that point, she caught a glimpse of the ambulance making its return trip to Exmoor. She turned quickly and went back to her chair. It looks like a hearse, she said miserably. Is it Andy? asked Judy of Molly in a whisper. Molly nodded her head. What a chump I've been, ejaculated Judy. It happened the night of the carnival, of course, pursued Nance. Yes. It was all my fault, she went on quietly. I would coast down one of those long hills and Andy didn't want me to. I knew I could, and I wanted to show him how well I could skate. Then, just as we got to the bottom, my heel came off, and we both tumbled. It didn't hurt us, but Andy was provoked, and then we quarreled. Of course, walking back made us late, and he missed the others. But, dear Nance, it might have happened just the same, even if he had been with the others, argued Molly. No, it couldn't have been so bad. He must have been lying in the snow a long time before they found him and was probably half frozen, she went on, ruthlessly inflicting pain on herself. They did go back and find him, fortunately, admitted Molly. He was the first and only boyfriend I ever had, continued Nance in a tone of extreme bitterness. I always thought I was a wallflower until I met him. Other girls like you two and Jessie have lots of friends and can spare one but I haven't any to spare. I only have Andy. Her voice broke and she began to sob. Oh, why was I so stubborn and cruel that night? Judy crept over and locked the door. She was sore in mind and body at sight of Nance's misery. I feel like a whipped cur, she thought, just as if someone had beaten me with a stick. Poor old Nance. You mustn't feel so hopeless about it, Nance, dear, Molly was saying. I'm sure he'll pull through. They wouldn't have brought him all this distance if he had been so badly off. They have brought him home to die, cried Nance fiercely, and I did it. I did it. She rocked herself back and forth. I want to be alone, she said suddenly. Of course, dear Nance, no one shall disturb you, said Molly, taking a pile of books off the table and a busy sign which she hung on the door. We'll bring up your supper. Don't come down this evening. But when the girls returned some hours later with a tray of food, Nance had gone to bed and turned her face to the wall, and she refused to eat a morsel. All next day it was the same. Nance remained in bed, ruthlessly cutting lessons and refusing to take anything but a cup of soup at lunchtime. The girls called at Dr. McLean's to inquire for Andy and found that his condition was much the same. Nance's condition was the same, too. She turned a deaf ear to all their arguments and declined to be reasoned with. She can't lie there forever, Judy exclaimed at last. But what are we to do, Judy? Molly asked. She's just nursing her troubles until she'll go into melancholia. I would go to Mrs. McLean, but she won't see anyone and the doctor is too unhappy to listen. I tried to tell him about Nance and he didn't hear a word I was saying. I didn't realize how much they adored Andy. Judy could offer no suggestion and Molly went off to the library to think. It occurred to her that Professor Green might give her some advice. He knew all about the friendship between Nance and Andy, and, besides, he had interested himself once before in Nance's troubles when he arranged for her to go to the McLean supper party the year before. Molly glanced at the clock. It was nearly half past four. He'll probably be in his little cloister study right now, she said to herself, and in three minutes she was rapping on the oak door in the corridor marked E. Green. Come in, called the professor. He was sitting at his study table, his back turned to her, writing busily. You're late, Dodo, he continued, without looking up. I expected you in time for lunch. Sit down and wait. I can't stop now. Don't speak to me for fifteen minutes. I'm finishing something that must go by the six o'clock mail. Molly sank into the depths of the nearest chair while the professor's pen scratched up and down monotonously. 
not since the famous night of her freshman year when she was locked in the cloisters had she been in the professor's sanctum and she looked about her with much curiosity i wish i had one just like it she thought it's so peaceful and quiet just the place to work in and write books on the elizabethan drama and lyric poetry and comic operas there was a nice leathery smell in the atmosphere of book bindings mingled with tobacco smoke and the only ornament she could discover except a small bronze bust of voltaire and a life mask of keats was a glazed paperweight in the very cerulean blue she herself was so fond of it caught the fading light from the window and shone forth from the desk like a bit of blue sky molly was sitting in a high-backed leather chair which quite hid her from judith blount who presently knocking on the door and opening it at the same moment entered the room like a hurricane cousin edwin may i come in i want to ask you something i can't possibly see you now judith you must wait until tomorrow i am very busy oh pshaw exclaimed the girl and banged the door as she departed into the corridor what a jarring element she was in all that peaceful stillness the muffled noises in the quadrangle seemed a hundred miles away molly rose and tiptoed to the door he'll be angrier than ever if he should find me here she thought i'll just get out quietly and explain some other time her hand was already on the doorknob when the professor wheeled around and faced her why miss brown he exclaimed was it you all the time i might have known my clumsy brother couldn't have been so quiet please excuse me faltered molly i am sure you were very busy i am awfully sorry to have disturbed you nonsense it's only unimportant things i won't be bothered with like the absurd questions judith thinks up to ask me and dodo's gossip about the fellows at exmoor but i am well aware that you never waste time i suspect you of being one of the busiest little ladies in wellington molly smiled somehow she liked to be called a little lady by this distinguished professor but your letter that must go by the six mail that can wait until morning he said he had just said it was to go at six but of course he had a right to change his mind sit down and tell me what's the trouble have you had bad news from home no it's about nance she began and told him the whole story you see she finished nance has had so few friends and she is very fond of andy because she thinks the accident was her fault she is just grieving herself into an awful state the professor sat with his chin resting on his hand poor little girl he said and the doctor and mrs mclean are in almost as bad a state themselves you know it's just a chance that andy will pull through he has developed pneumonia oh dear with all those broken bones and that terrible gash isn't it dreadful pretty bad have you tried talking to miss oldham i've tried everything and nothing will move her it's just a kind of stubborn misery that seems to have paralyzed her mind and body the two sat in silence for a moment then the professor said suppose i go down to queen's tonight and see miss oldham do you think she would be induced to come down into mrs markham's sitting-room and have a talk with me i should think so she wouldn't have the courage to decline to see one of the faculty very well if she is roused to get up and come downstairs she may come to her senses but don't go yet i have something to tell you something that doesn't concern miss oldham but er myself do you remember the opera i told you about molly nodded it's going into rehearsal christmas week and will open in six weeks are you pleased molly was pleased of course she was always glad of other people's good luck how would you like to go to the opening he asked it would be wonderful but but i don't see how i can i told you there were complications yes i know he answered but you're to forget complications that night and enjoy my first attempt to be amusing i'll try answered molly not realizing how her reply might sound to the author of the comic opera who only smiled good-naturedly and said the music will be pretty at any rate they sat talking about the opera for some time in fact until the tower clock clanged six i never dreamed it was so late apologized molly and i have kept you all this time i know you must be awfully busy i hope you will forgive me didn't i just say that your time was quite as important as mine he said and when two very important people get together the moments are not wasted that night the professor did call on nance at queen's and the unhappy girl was obliged to get into her things as quickly as possible and go down 
What he said to her, Molly and Judy never knew, but in an hour Nance returned to them in a normal, sensible state of mind, and not again did she turn her face to the wall and refuse to be comforted. There is no doubt in my mind that Professor Green is the nicest person in Wellington, that is, of the faculty, thought Molly, as she settled under the reading lamp and prepared to study her lit lesson. End of chapter 14「Fifteen of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. A Recovery and a Visit. Young Annie McLean was not destined to be gathered to his forefathers yet, however, and before Christmas he was able to sit up in bed and beg his mother fretfully to telephone to Exmoor and ask some of the fellows to come over. The doctor says you're not to see any of the boys yet, Andy, replied his mother firmly. If I can't see boys, is there anything I can see? He demanded with extreme irritability. Mrs. McLean smiled and a little later dispatched a note to Queen's Cottage. That afternoon, Nance came shyly into Andy's room and sat down in a low chair beside the white iron hospital bed which had been substituted for the big old mahogany one. Your mother says you are lots better, Andy, she said. Andy gave a happy, sheepish smile and wiggled two fingers weakly, which meant they were to shake hands. Mother was afraid for the fellows to come, he said, on account of my heart. I suppose she thinks a girl can't affect anybody's heart. I'm so quiet, you see, said Nance, but I'll go if you think it's going to hurt you. You wouldn't like to see me cry, would you? I boo-hooed like a kid this morning because they wouldn't let me have broiled ham for breakfast. I smelt it cooking. It would be just like having to give up broiled ham for breakfast to have you go, Nance. Sit down again, will you? And don't leave me until I tell you. Since I've been sick, I've learned to be a boss. I'm sorry I didn't let you boss me that night, Andy, remarked Nance meekly. I ought never to have coasted down the hill. I've wanted to apologize ever since. Have you been blaming yourself? He broke in. It wasn't your fault at all. It all happened because I was angry and didn't look where I was going. I have had a lot of time to think lately, and I've decided that there is nothing so stupid as getting mad. You always have to pay for it somehow. Look at me, a human wreck for indulging in a fit of rage. There's a fellow at X who lost his temper in an argument over a baseball game and walked into a door and broke his nose. Nance laughed. There are other ways of curing tempers besides broken bones, she said. Just plain remorse is as good as a broken nose. At least I found it so. Did you have the remorse, Nance? asked Andy, wiggling the fingers of his good hand again. Yes, awfully, Andy, answered the young girl, slipping her hand into his. I felt just like a murderer. The nurse came in presently to say that the fifteen minutes allotted for the call was up. It had slipped by on the wings of the wind, but their friendship had been reestablished on the old happy basis. Andy was unusually polite to his mother and the nurse that day, and Nance went straight to the village and bought two big bunches of violets, one for Molly and one for Judy. In some way she must give expression to the rejoicing in her heart, and this was the only means she could think of. Besides Andy McLean's recovery, several other nice things happened before Christmas. One morning Judy burst into her friend's room like a wild creature waving a letter in each hand. They are coming, she cried. They have each written to tell me so. Isn't it perfect? Isn't it glorious? No need to tell Molly and Nance who they were. These girls were fully aware that Judy treated her mother and father exactly like two sweethearts, giving each an equal share of her abundant affections. But the others were not so well informed about Judy's family relations. Otoyo Sen began to clap her hands and laugh joyously in sympathy. Is it two honorable young gentlemen who arriving come to see me keen? Now, Atoyo, how often have I told you not to say arriving come, exclaimed Molly. I know it's a fascinating combination and difficult to forget in moments of excitement, but it's very bad English. Miss keen, she is so happy, replied the Japanese girl, speaking slowly and carefully. I cannot remember in when I see so much great joy. Wouldn't you be happy, too, if your honorable mamma and papa were coming to Wellington to visit you, you cunning little sparrow bird? asked Judy, seizing Otoyo's hands and dancing her wildly about the room. 
Oh, it is honorable mother and father. That is differently. It is not the same in Japan. Young Japanese girl might make great deal of noise over something new and very pretty, you see. But it is not respectful to jump up so about parents arriving. There was a great laugh at this. Atoya was an especial pet at Queen's with the older girls. She's like a continuous performance of the Mikado, remarked Edith Williams. Three little maids from school rolled into one, the quaintest, most adorable little person. And when do these honorable parents arriving come? asked Margaret Wakefield. Tomorrow afternoon, answered Judy. Where shall I get rooms? What shall I take them to see? Shall I give a tea and ask the girls to meet them? Don't you think a sleighing party would be fun? And a fudge party in the evening. Papa loves fudge. Do you think it would be a good idea to have dinner up here in Molly and Nancy's room or let Papa give a banquet at the inn? Do suggest, everybody. Judy was too excited to sit down. She was walking up and down the room, her cheeks blazing and her eyes as uncannily bright as two elfin lights on a dark night. Be calm, Judy, said Molly, taking her friend by the shoulders and pushing her into a chair. You'll work yourself into a high fever with your excitable ways. Now, sit down there and we'll talk it over quietly and arrange a program. Judy sat down obediently. I suppose it does seem funny to all of you, but you see, Mama and Papa and I have been brought up together. You mean you brought them up? asked Edith. We brought each other up. They call me little sister, and until I went off to college, because Papa insisted I must have some education, life was just one beautiful lark. What a jolly time you must have had, observed Nance with a wistful smile which reminded the self-centered Judy at last that it was not exactly kind to pile it on too thickly about her delightful parents. Not a little curiosity was felt by the Queen's girls to see Mr. and Mrs. Keene, whom Judy had described as paragons of beauty and wit, and they assembled at Wellington Station in a body to meet the distinguished pair. Judy herself was in a quiver of happy excitement, and when finally the train pulled into the station, she rushed from one platform to another in her eagerness. Of course, they had taken the chair car down, but she was too bewildered to remember that there was but one such coach on the Wellington train, and it was usually the rear car. I don't find them. Oh, Mama! Oh, Papa! You couldn't have missed the train, she cried, addressing the spirits of the air. Just then, a very tall, handsome man with eyes exactly like Judy's pinioned her arms from behind. Well, little sister, don't you know your own father? He was just as Judy had described him, and her word picture also fitted Mrs. Keene, a dainty, pretty little woman with a doll-like face and flaxen hair who would never have given the impression that she was in the habit of roughing it in engineering camps, sleeping out of doors, riding across sun-baked plains on Texas Broncos, and accompanying her husband wherever he went on his bridge and railroad building trips. Judy hasn't had much home life, she said later to Molly. We had to take our choice, little sister and I, between a home without Papa or Papa without a home, and we decided that he was 10,000 times more delightful than the most wonderful palace ever built. Her extravagant speeches reminded Molly of Judy, but the mother was much gentler and quieter than her excitable daughter, and perhaps not so clever. They dined at Queen's that night and made a tour of the entire house except Judith Blount's room, all apartments having been previously spruced up for inspection. Otoyo had shown her respect for the occasion by hanging a Japanese lantern from the chandelier and loading a little table with meat sweets, which she offered to the guests when they paused in her room during their triumphal progress through the house. Later, Molly and Nance entertained at a fudge and stunt party, and Mr. and Mrs. Keene were initiated into the secrets of life at Queen's. They entered into the fun like two children, and one of the stunts, a dialogue between the Williams sisters, amused Mr. Keene so much that he laughed loud and long until his wife shook him by the shoulder and exclaimed, Hush, Bobby. Remember, you're not on the plains, but in a girl's boarding school. Yes, Robert, said Judy, who frequently spoke to her parents by their first names. Remember that you are in a place where law and order must be maintained. You shouldn't give such laugh-provoking stunts, then, answered Mr. Keene but I'll try and remember to put on the soft pedal hereafter. Then Molly, accompanying herself on Judy's guitar, sang, Big camp meetin' down the swamp, oh my, hallelujah! Mr. Keene suddenly joined in with a deep, booming bass. He had learned that song many years before in the South, he said, and had never forgotten it. He never forgets anything, said Judy proudly, laying her cheek against her father's. And now, what will you sing, Bobby, to amuse the ladies? 
Mr. Keen, without the least embarrassment, took the guitar and, looking so amazingly like Judy that they might have been twins, sang, Young Jeremy Gilson Johnson Jenks was a lad of scarce nineteen. It was a delightful song and the chorus so catchy that after the second verse the entire fudge and stunt party joined in with, Oh, marry me, marry me, sang young Jeremy, marry me, lovely Lou. Presently, Mr. Keen, seizing his daughter around the waist, began dancing, and in a moment everybody was twirling to that lively tune, bumping up against each other and tumbling on the divans in an effort to circle around the room. All the time, Mrs. Keene, standing on a chair in the corner, was gently remonstrating and calling out, Now, Bobby, you mustn't make so much noise. This isn't a mining camp. Nobody heard her soft expostulations, and only the little lady herself heard the sharp rap on the door and noticed a piece of paper shoved under the crack. Rescuing it from under the feet of the dancers and seeing that it was addressed to Miss Keene, she opened and read it. Oh, how very mortifying, she exclaimed. Now, Bobby, I knew you would get these girls into some scrape. You are always so noisy. See here, our own Judy being reprimanded. You must make your father explain to the president or matron or whoever this Miss Blount is that it was all his fault. What in the world are you talking about, Julia Keene? demanded Judy, snatching the note from her mother and reading it rapidly. Well, of all the unexampled impudence, she cried when she had finished. Will you be good enough to listen to this? Miss Keene, you and your family are a little too noisy for the comfort of the other tenants in this house. Those of us who wish to study and rest cannot do so. This is not a dance hall nor a mining camp. Will you kindly arrange to entertain more quietly? The singing is especially obnoxious. Judith Blount Judy was in such a white heat of rage when she finished reading the note that her mother was obliged to quiet her by smoothing her forehead and saying over and over, There, there, my darling, don't mind it so much. No doubt the young person was quite right. Mr. Keene was intensely amused over the letter. He read it to himself twice, then laughed and slapped his knee, exclaiming, By Jove, Judy, my love, it takes a woman to write a note like that. A woman? A cat, broke in Judy. Mrs. Keene put her hand over her daughter's mouth and looked shocked. Oh, Judy, my dearest, you mustn't say such unladylike things, she cried. It's just because she wasn't invited, continued Judy. I wouldn't let the girls ask her this time. She usually is invited and makes as much racket as any of us. It was rather mean to leave her out, observed Molly. I suppose she's sore about it. But we didn't ask all the girls at Queen's. Sally Marks and two freshmen were not invited, and if we had gone outside, we'd have invited Mary Stewart and Mabel Hinton. Still, said Mr. Keene, there's nothing meaner than the left-out feeling. It cuts deep. Suppose we smooth things over by asking her to our next party. Let me see. Will all of you give Mrs. Keene and me the pleasure of having you dine with us tomorrow evening at the inn? Now, may I borrow some writing materials, he added, after a chorus of acceptances had been raised. Nance conducted him to her writing desk, which is always the acme of neatness and well stocked with stationery. Here is the letter that Mr. Keene wrote to Judith Blount, which Judy, looking over her father's shoulder, read aloud as it revolved. Dear Miss Blount, Blount, did you say her name was? Humph. You were quite right to scold Mr. Keene and me for making so much noise. It was inconsiderate of us. But Bobby, protested Mrs. Keene, it isn't fair to lay the blame on me and make me write the letter, too. Be quiet, my love, answered her husband. Will you not give us the pleasure of your company at dinner tomorrow evening at the inn? We are anxious to show you what really quiet, law-abiding people we are and Mr. Keene and I will be much disappointed if you do not allow us the opportunity to prove it to you. Judy's father paused, his pen suspended, while he asked, Didn't I see bill posters at the station announcing a performance at the opera house? Yes, cried Judy. They're giving the Silver King. Dinner will be a little early, he wrote, because Mr. Keene is planning to take us all to the play afterwards. He will call for you in... What shall I call for you in? The bus! promptly answered every girl in the room. The bus at 6.15. Anticipating much pleasure in having you with us tomorrow, believe me. Most cordially yours, Julia S. Keen. Now, Julia, my love, sit down and copy what I've written in your best handwriting, and we'll try to smooth down this fiery young person's ruffled feathers. 
Mrs. Keene obediently copied the note. After all, it wasn't an unkind revenge, and Otoyo delivered it at Judith's door while the others chatted quietly and absorbed quantities of hot fudge and crackers. Presently, Otoyo stole softly back into the room. What did she say, little one? asked Judy. She was very stilly, answered Otoyo shyly. She spoke nothing whatever. I thought it more wisely to depart and go. The laugh that was raised at this lucid report restored good humor in the company. A vehicle called for Mr. and Mrs. Keene at a quarter before ten to take them down into the village, and it was not long before every light was out in Queen's Cottage but one in a small single room in an upper story. Here, in front of the mirror over the dressing table, sat a black-eyed girl in a red silk dressing gown. Judith, she said fiercely to her image in the glass, can't you remember that you are too poor to insult people any longer? Then she rolled up Mrs. Keene's note into a little ball and flung it across the room with such force that it hit the other wall and bounded back again to her feet, and she ground it under her heel. After this exhibition of impotent rage, she put out her light and flung herself into the bed, where she tossed about uneasily and exclaimed to herself, I won't be poor. I won't work. I hate this hideous little room, and I loathe Queen's Cottage. I wish I had never been born. Nevertheless, Judith Blount did humble herself next day to accept Mrs. Keene's invitation. At the dinner, she was sullen and quiet, but she could not hide her enjoyment of the melodrama later. The one taste which she had in common with her brother Richard was an affection for the theater, no matter how crude the acting nor how hackneyed the play. But the insulting letter that she had sent to Judy Keene widened the breach between her and the Queen's girls, and no amount of effort on her part after that could bridge it over. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Molly Brown's Sophomore Days by Nell Speed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Debbie R. Baker Robinson. Christmas Eve Plots Molly was not sorry to spend Christmas in Wellington this year. Numbers of invitations had come to her, but even Mary Stewart could not tempt her away from Queen's Cottage. Otoyo and I shan't be lonesome, she said. We have a lot of work to do before the mid-year exams, and by the time you come back, Otoyo's adverbs are going to modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. You'll see, she assured her friends cheerfully. And when the last trainload pulled out of Wellington and she trudged back along the deserted avenue, there was a strange gladness in her heart. I'm not homesick and I'm not lonesome, she said to herself. I'm just happy. Except for Otoyo's lessons, I'm going to give myself a holiday. I'm going to read. Poetry, lots of it, all I want, and to sit in the library and think. I'm going to take long walks alone. It will be like seeing the last of a dear friend, because Wellington will not be Wellington to me when I am installed at O'Reilly's. Hardly half a dozen girls remained at college that Christmas, and Molly was glad that she knew them only by sight. She was almost glad that the doctor and Mrs. McLean had taken Andy south. She could not explain this unusual lack of sociability on her part, but she did not want to be asked anywhere. It was a pleasure to sit with Otoyo at one end of the long table in Queen's dining room and talk about the good times they had been having. As for the future, Molly hung a thick veil between these quiet days and the days to come. Through it dimly, she could see the bare little room at O'Reilly's sometimes, but whenever this vision rose in her mind, she resolutely began to think of something else. It would be time enough to look it in the face at the end of the semester when she must break the news to Nance and Judy and pack her things for the move. Most of the girls had left on Saturday, and it seemed to Molly that Sunday was the quietest day of her whole life. Scarcely a dozen persons appeared at the chapel for Vespers, and the responses had to be spoken, the choir having departed for the holidays. Monday was Christmas Eve, and on that morning Mrs. Murphy, kind, good-natured soul that she was, carried Molly's breakfast to her room with a pile of letters from home. Molly read them while she drank her coffee and saw plainly through their thinly-veiled attempts at cheerfulness. It was evident that her family's fortunes were at a low ebb. Her mother was glad that Miss Walker had arranged for her to stay at college and she hoped Molly would be happy in her new quarters. Molly finished her dressing. 
if only i could do something she said to herself fiercely as she pinned on the blue tam buttoned up her sweater and started out for a walk otoyo that model of industry was deep in her lessons as molly passed her door i'll be back for lunch otoyo she called as she hurried downstairs she had no sooner left the house than queen's cottage became the scene of the most surprising activities little otoyo leaped to her feet as if she had unexpectedly sat on a hornet's nest and trotted downstairs as fast as her diminutive legs could carry her mrs murphy i am ready she called there was no telling what plot they were hatching these two souls from nations as widely different as night from day boxes were pulled from mysterious closets mrs murphy and one of the maids emerged from the cellar with their arms full of greens and stranger still the dignified professor of english literature actually made his appearance at the kitchen door with a big market basket on one arm and but what the professor carried under the other arm had been carefully concealed with wrapping paper these things he deposited with mrs murphy it's a pleasant sight surely to see you this christmas eve morning professor exclaimed the irish woman you're as ruddy as a hollyberry, sir, and no mistake. Well, Mrs. Murphy, I'm a Christmas green, you know, answered the professor, and Mrs. Murphy laughed like a child over the little joke. As for the young Japanese lady, she is that busy, sir. You would never expect a haven born to take on so about the birthday of our blessed Lord. But she's half a Catholic already, sir, and she's bought a holy candle to burn tonight you're a good woman mrs murphy said the professor standing beside the well-laden kitchen table and whatever she learns from you will do her good too she's a long way from home and i have no doubt she'll be very thankful for a little mothering poor child indeed and she is as cheerful as the day is long sir and so is the other young lady and she's used to a deal of rejoicing in her family too i can tell by the way she loves the entertaining her company never goes away hungry and thirsty sir it's tea and cake always and more besides have you a little spare room in your oven so that i can bake some muffins for some friends this morning mrs murphy she'll say of a sunday she's that hospitable and kind sir there's nobody like her in queens i'd be sorry ever to lose her should you call her hair red mrs murphy asked the professor irrelevantly it's more red than anything else sir especially when the weather's damp and what color should you say her eyes were mrs murphy and you've not seen her eyes surely sir if you can be asking me that question there is blue as blue sir like the skies in summer the professor blinked his own brown eyes very thoughtfully well good day mrs murphy i must be off do you think you and miss sen together can manage things we can surely said mrs murphy she's as neat and quick a little body as i've seen the side the atlantic my sister gets here at noon good day and the professor was off around the house and across the campus before mrs murphy could take breath to continue her conversation in the meantime molly was hastening through the pine woods to a grove where she had once seen some holly bushes in the pocket of her sweater were a pair of scissors and a penknife we must have a little holiday decoration otoyo and i she said to herself and it's lots nicer to gather it than buy it at the grocery store I suppose my box from home will reach here tonight. I'll ask Mr. and Mrs. Murphy up tomorrow and give a party. There'll be turkey in it, of course, and plum cake and blackberry cordial. It won't be such a bad Christmas. Mr. and Mrs. Murphy are dears. I must do up their presents this afternoon. I hope Atoya will like the little book. She'll be interested to know that Professor Green wrote it. As she hurried along, breathing in the frosty air, like Pilgrim, she spied a figure a great way off coming toward her. Another leftover, she thought, and went on her way, her steps keeping time to a poem she was repeating out loud. St. Agnes's Eve, ah, bitter chill it was, the owl for all his feathers was a cold, the hare limped trembling through the frozen grass, and silence was the flock in woolly fold. Molly had just repeated the last line over, too absorbed to notice the advancing figure through the pine trees except subconsciously to see that it was a girl ah here's the holly she exclaimed numb were the beadsman's fingers she knelt on the frozen ground and began cutting off branches with a penknife i suppose you are rather surprised to see me aren't you molly looked up it was judith blount why where did you come from judith she asked 
didn't she go up to new york friday after all i was supposed to but i didn't i am staying down in the village at the inn i may go this afternoon i haven't decided yet to tell the truth i am not very anxious to see my family papa isn't at home and richard and mamma are rather gloomy company i think i'd rather spend christmas almost anywhere than with them this year but your mother judith exclaimed molly shocked at judith's lack of feeling doesn't she need you now more than ever why demanded judith suspiciously what do you know of my affairs i happen to know a great deal answered molly since they have a good deal to do with my own affairs why what do you mean now judith went on molly this is christmas and we won't quarrel about our misfortunes whatever mine are it's not your fault i'm gathering some holly to decorate for otoyo and me won't you help me no thanks answered the other coldly i don't feel much like christmas this year she burst out after a pause i'm seeing my last of college now unless i choose to stay under certain conditions and i won't i won't she repeated stamping her foot fiercely on the frozen earth which gave out a rhythmic sound under the blow queen's is bad enough but if i am to descend to a room over the post office after the semester i'd i'd rather die she added furiously we're in the same box thought molly i can appreciate how she feels poor soul i was just about as bad myself at first do you blame me went on the unhappy judith through no fault of mine i've had troubles heaped on me all winter first one and then another i have had to suffer for another person's sins to be crushed into a nobody taken from my rightful place and shoved off first into one miserable little hole and then another i tell you i don't think it's fair it's unkind it's cruel molly was not accustomed to hear people pity themselves she had been brought up to regard it as an evidence of cowardice and low breeding i've just about made up my mind continued judith to chuck the whole thing and go on the stage i can sing and dance and i believe i could get into almost any chorus richard of course wouldn't hear of my taking part in his new opera and he could arrange it just as easily as not but he doesn't approve and neither does mamma but it would be less humiliating than this she pointed to wellington but judith it would be a great deal more humiliating ejaculated molly you would be fussed with and scolded and you'd hear horrid language and live in wretched hotels and boarding houses a great deal worse than the rooms over the post office it was very little molly knew about chorus girl life but that little she now turned to good account you would have to travel a lot on smoky uncomfortable trains and stay up late at night whether you wanted to or not you wouldn't be treated like a lady she added innocently and you'd have to cover your face with grease and paint every night i don't care answered judith anything would be better than being banished from wellington and living in a room next to that talkative little southern girl who does laundry work judith exclaimed molly i'm being banished from wellington too i've taken a room at o'reilly's i've been through all the misery you're going through and i know what you are suffering i was almost at the point of going home once but judith don't you see that it's rather cowardly to enjoy prosperity and the good things that come in time of peace and then run away when the real fight begins and it wouldn't do any good either it would only make other people suffer and would be much worse off ourselves don't you think judith blount b a would be a more important person than judith blount chorus girl judith began picking the leaves off a piece of holly almost everything she did was destructive i suppose you're right she said at last mamma and richard would have a fit and the chorus girl role wouldn't suit me either i'm too high-tempered and i can't stand criticism but you're going to o'reilly's that puts a new face on it i'll change to o'reilly's too molly groaned inwardly she would almost rather live next to a talking machine than a firebrand they aren't such bad rooms she said quietly when we get our things in they'll be quite nice and now i'll hurry on continued judith utterly absorbed in her own affairs i think i will take the train to new york this afternoon i suppose it would be rather cowardly to leave mamma and richard alone this christmas especially good-bye she held out her hand what are your plans are you going to do anything tonight to celebrate 
No, answered Molly, shaking Judith's hand with as much cordiality as she could muster. Just go to bed. I thought perhaps you had formed some scheme of entertainment with my cousins. You mean the Greens? I didn't know they were here. I don't know that they are here either. They have been careful to keep their plans from me. Molly ignored this implication. I hope you'll enjoy your Christmas, Judith, she said. Perhaps something will turn up. Something will have to turn up after next year, exclaimed Judith, for I have made up my mind to one thing. I shall never work for a living. And she strode off through the pine woods with her chin in the air, as if she were defying all the powers in heaven to make her change this resolution. Molly shivered as she knelt to clip the holly. She seemed to see a picture of a tiny little Judith standing in the middle of a vast, endless plain, raging and shaking her fists at, what, the empty air. She sighed. I don't suppose I could ever make her understand that she'd be lots happier if she'd just let go and stop thinking that God has a grudge against her. End of chapter 16